Well, uh, it's a lecture on the Mahabharata, and so it's got to have an outer frame, and a frame to the outer frame, and even an introduction to the outer frame to that frame. Um, so you will quickly notice that there is no PowerPoint, and there is no handout. And that has to do with a <coughs> series of events uh, that started yesterday morning. <laughs> uh, this uh, is a teaching moment, teachable moment. Uh, there are some dangers in not preparing until the last possible minute, because that requires nothing to go wrong. And in um, <coughs> I guess an in, uh, from the Indian point of view, I am running my Shani Mahadasha, and so <laughs> this is what has caused a certain amount of uh, obstacles and slowing down of events. So things are uh, going to be a little bit more fragmentary uh, than I would have liked, but I hope you will bear with me. Um, uh, before I actually start, let me just uh, try to f give you an idea of what the parts are going to be. There will be the actual frame, that is the beginning of the lecture. Then I will, I'm going to talk about elephants for a while. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the Mahabharata and elephants. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Mahabharata tradition in a larger sense within Sanskrit literature. And then modern scholarly attitudes toward this larger traditional material some examples of what I mean, and then finally a proposal or a plea, which is very ill-formed at this point, and I would uh, welcome some suggestions of how to improve it. So can you hear me all right? It's OK? All right, well, so thank you for the invitation and um, for all the efforts of Clemente and the rest of you in actually getting me here. Uh, this was very high maintenance. Uh, for the staff, and thank you, by the way, for the swag bag, which I've never, I've never received such a thing before, but I have all kinds of nice <laughs> uni University of Michigan logoed objects to take home with me. Uh, it's an honor to be invited to speak in a lecture series that celebrates Tom Troutman, a colleague, and I hope I may say friend, for many decades. His many and varied publications offer a useful and sane treatment of contentious issues that crop up in my part of the field. Among others, the Aryan invasion, the history of Indology, race theory, the, and the Dravidian Aryan cultural divide. Then there are his, his important early work on the Arthashastra as a window into Indian society and polity in the ancient period, which has given rise to more recent work by other scholars. This has become a very active field in the last 10 years. And then there is his book on elephants and kings. This is my favorite recent book on ancient India, with its combination of political and environmental history, and the effortless way in which it refers to sources from Sanskrit and other subjects across Asia in aid of a surprising thesis about the environmental benefits of an ancient and distinctively Indian war technology. What I found striking was the way that uh, Troutmanji draws our attention back to the obvious thing to which we have become entirely acclimated as scholars and students of India, the prominence of elephants. Elephants are everywhere, in fact. They are depicted in the iconography, painting, sculpture, and other decorative arts. We see them there, the largest of what some would call the charismatic large fauna of India, described in their military and industrial uses, their politically symbolic uses, their behavior in the wild, contributing to the Indian ecology, their ongoing conflict with farmers, and the disquiet that they occasion lonely travelers on forest roads. So also are they depicted in Sanskrit literature. Just after I finished Tom's book on elephants and kings, I went back and read through a literary work of the early 8th century, the Dashakumara Charita, a composition of narrative prose by Dundin, which tells the story of 10 princes who are friends and their escapades upon parting from one another and scattering through the four corners of the country. Although Dundon's work is meant first and foremost to be an entertainment, 
It is also meant, um, meant to emphasize the skill, the, the value of skills and of training. But it is not terribly concerned with moral rectitude. Some among these 10 behave rather badly. <clears throat> One might go so far as to say that it describes the lighthearted activities of young members of the ruling class who feel constrained by friendship and ambition, but are not overly bound by conscience or law. Having just read the book on elephants, I kept track of where elephants turn up in the Deshukumara Charita and how they are depicted. What are they there for? Statistically, elephants turn up most often in literary similes. Such and such figure was as wild as an elephant in must. One reads more than once. But actual maddened elephants do also appear. At one point, there is a nanny lost in the jungle with her charges, uh, gone astra having strayed from a royal journey. One of the children under her care, she later relates, a character who will reappear later in the story, is carried off by a wild elephant. Other elephants in rut similarly disrupt, disrupt groups of people and drive characters off in new directions, creating turns in the plot. To me, the most noticeable use that elephants are put to in the Dashakumara Charita, however, is as the instrument of execution. More than one of our heroes gets into a scrape with the law, ends up before a court, and is sentenced to death by elephant. <laughs> Yet the hero always escapes from this imminent execution, usually by climbing onto that very elephant that was to trample him and subduing it to his will. He thereby, very edifyingly, displays the value of an expertise in elephant riding, one of many skills the young man about town should command. In fact, such is the level of training of our heroes that not a single person is put to death by elephant in Dundon's work, though many are sentenced and brought shackled to the execution spot, the elephant looming in front of them. It is almost as though death by elephant is too spectacular, requires too much buildup. Perhaps in this way, we might think of those James Bond films and the like where the ever resourceful hero escapes from an ingeniously contrived death whose instruments the audience have been made to imagine in harrowing detail. Elephants turn up in other literature, of course, and certainly in the Mahabharata. Professor Troutman turns to the Mahabharata several times in his book, pointing out the use of elephants in war formations and in royal pageantry. The epic Mahabharata also contains lots of lore about how to capture and train elephants. And when read between the lines, it shows evidence of the dis geographical distribution of elephants and of the peoples who are best at handling them. So much we learn from his book on elephants and kings. But what about elephants, one might wonder, as characters in their own right in the Mahabharata? Do elephants ever come into the foregr foreground as the protagonists of the story, whether the main story or a side story? The most well-known ele elephant in the epic is something of a shadow, a, pro a protagonist in spite of himself. This is the elephant who is crucial to unfolding the main narrative, but he is mostly there as collateral damage, as a necessary casualty. He is a war elephant whose name, by unlucky chance, is Ashwatthaman. I suspect everyone here knows this story, or at least that Ashwatthaman, the elephant, shares his name with the son of Drona. Drona, or Dronacharya, is the paradoxical Brahmin with warrior skills, the instructor in martial arts for the epic's heroes and anti-heroes. Drona cannot be defeated by Pandavas, that is, by the Pandavas, that is, our heroes. They are the good guys, at least notionally. But one of the central themes of the narrative involves an erosion of the Pandavas' claims to military virtue. By the rules of courtly loyalty, Drona, their guru, is required to fight on the opposing side in the great war that the Mahabharata describes. This presents the Pandavas with a problem. 
Drona must die for the Pandavas to win. But in order to kill him, the Pandavas must resort to a dirty trick, as most of you know. <clears throat> the trick is to lie, something that is fair neither in a fight nor in sport. The Pandavas tell Drona that elsewhere on the battlefield, Ashwataman has been slain. Drona goes into a swoon, thinking his son is dead. He then recovers and fights on in a rage until he comes before Yudhishthira, the most truthful of the five Pandava brothers. Yudhishthira untruthfully confirms that Ashwataman is indeed slain. From saying this untruth, the first he is ever knowingly told, Yudhishthira loses a unique righteous sheen that he has possessed up until then. His chariot, which had always hovered a few inches off the ground, thereupon sinks down onto it. But Drona believes him, nevertheless. The point is that Ashwataman, Drona's son, is not dead. What the Pandavas have said is, in their minds, less of a lie, not so much an outlaw, outright lie, as what these days might be called an alternative fact. <laughs> For there is, an, there is an Ashwataman who has been slain on the field. This is the elephant, the mount of Indravarman, the king of Malva. As part of this plan, Bhima, the mighty Herculean brother among the Pandavas, finds this Ashwataman, who by the way is fighting on the Pandava's side, and kills him. Bhima then is the first to shamefacedly tell Drona that Ashwataman is dead, which is true after a fashion. There is an Ashwataman who is dead, after all. It's just not the one that Drona thinks it is. The result of this lie is that Drona gives up fighting, and the Pandavas set about killing him while he doesn't fight back. This killing removes yet more of their heroic luster. Drona's death has consequences for the prosecution of the rest of the war, and those are what the narrative follows. But as for the elephant, Ashwataman, the elephant slain to make the lie less of a lie, we, we learn nothing more about him in the Mahabharata. He's only there as a convenience, really just the mention of an elephant, a an elephant in name only, so to speak. To find an elephant that is even less present and yet totally decisive to the narrative, one has to turn to the Ramayana, where an imagined elephant is tucked into a backstory, a backstory that is suddenly remembered at a crucial moment. This is the elephant that Dasharatha, Rama's father, killed one night while he was out hunting long ago. Or rather, Dasharatha thought he was killing an elephant. He aimed his arrow at the sound of glugging coming from the river beside him, thinking it was an elephant drinking. In fact, it was a boy filling a jug, a Brahmin boy looking after his aging parents. The death of this boy brings a curse on Dasharatha, that he too will die of grief at the loss of a son, a curse that Dasharatha remembers only as he dies. <clears throat> Though unremembered, the curse has been there all along. It determines the course of the rest of the story and foreshadows its central theme, the pain of separation from loved ones. Here, the entire story arc, as the author Valmiki unfolds it, proceeds from a fictive elephant, a boy really, mistaken for an elephant. Now, not all families in the epics are as loving, and indeed not even families of Brahmin sages are so depicted in the Mahabharata. There is an elephant who appears early on in the Bharata story as a principal character in another backstory. This time it is the backstory of Vainatea, or Garuda, the enormous eagle. This story is told in the early, early stages of the Adi Paravan, the first book of the epic, in the snaky section, the section that follows on from the death of Parikshit from snake bite in Middle Age, Parikshit being the descendant of the Pandavas and among the Bharata lineage, the only survivor into the next era of the war that took place as the epic's central event. Early on in this backstory of Garuda, we hear of how he has come into being as something new in the world. 
as he flies around trying to find some food or really trying to learn what it is that he can eat, he comes upon a sage dwelling near a lake who tells him the story of two brothers, Vibhavasu and Supratika, who are rishis, and they have appropriately Vedic names, by the way. These brothers had lived on the shores of this same lake once. They owned property, but, it was sh but they shared the property in common. And in a story that probably has many real life echoes, the younger brother proposed that they partition the property so that he could have his own in his own right, thus foreshadowing one of the main themes of the Mahabharata, both disharmony in families and disputes over property. The elder brother curses the younger to become an elephant called Supratika, while the younger in turn curses the elder to become a turtle. The two are still there in the area, Vainatea learns. They are enormous. One is seven leagues tall, the other seven leagues broad, and both are still filled with enmity for each other. These, the sage say, says, would make excellent food for a large eagle. And at that moment, the turtle emerges from the lake and gets into a fight with the elephant in front of Vainatea, who carries them both off for food. After flying for some time, he alights on a tree, whereupon the branch he rests on breaks under the enormous weight of eagle, elephant, and turtle. Vainatea catches the branch to save it, because hanging from it, he notices, are a hundred or so sages called the Valakilyas. These are mini sages who all live on this same branch. And at this point, the story goes on to relate the background of the Valakilyas at some length, because it's important. They are the ancestors of some of the more central uh, figures in the story. But in doing so, the Mahabharata turns aside from Supratika, the elephant, and his brother, Vibhavasu, the turtle. As far as we know, they escape their destiny as food and are never eaten and live to fight each other another day. So there, however, briefly, was an elephant in the foreground. Now, your, your heads may be reeling at this point. <clears throat> And I should pause for a moment to point out uh, that a little bit that the medium is the message here, uh, and that a lot of the Mahabharata around its edges is just like this. One story leads on to another, and at the same time folds back on itself, opening up sort of quasi-fractal narrative elements. And there's another elephant, also called Supratika, by the way, in the Mahabharata, who actually is an elephant. It's probably a different elephant, might be the same one. He's a war elephant, belongs to Bhagadatta. He runs across Bhima. Uh, I'm, I have a whole section here about that, but I, I won't skip over that. Just to say that there are two Supratikas, both elephants. They seem to be different ones, and they both figure in the story. But again, for all of this elephant activity, there isn't that much from the elephant's point of view. Other elephants have speaking roles in the Mahabharata, but elephants don't have much of a voice, so to speak in this epic. I can't find a more central elephant than the ones I have mentioned, one whose opinions about things are sought out and recorded. If I have missed one in preparation for this lecture, please let me know. Now, let, I'm going to move on to the prominence of the Mahabharata. So I have meandered from elephants to the subject of the Mahabharata, which is what was promised for today, and particular to the way ways that the Mahabharata has been read over the centuries. I think it is not controversial to claim that the Mahabharata became central to Indian high culture, as this is preserved in Sanskrit and Prakrit literature, and in painting, sculpture, and the decorative and performative arts, beginning in the early centuries of the first millennium. The main stories of the epic, are, and many of the side stories, are known to early classical works, the Buddha Charata and the Saundarananda of, Ashwago uh, of Ashwagosha. Elements of the story are there in the Artha Shastra and in the Manusmriti. And this central position of the Mahabharata was only strengthened in the second millennium. There are scholarly studies and catalogs of all the Sanskrit dramas and poems and Mahakavyas that as take as their starting point episodes from the Mahabharata. I won't retail them all here, but they include some of the most celebrated works by some of the most celebrated Sanskrit authors, culminating perhaps in the Naishadhiya Charita, 
the poetic rendering by Sri Harsha of the first part of the Nala Damayanti story, a work of luxuriant and confident genius, a composition that puts one in mind of some of the later works of James Joyce. There are also epitomes and easier retellings of the epic, for example, Kshemendra's Bharata Manjari, produced in Kashmir around the turn of the first millennium into the second. I'm going to jump over a lot and simply say, indeed, the prominence of the Mahabharata continues even today in modern media, in television and film, sometimes explicitly and in period costume, but almost as much in adaptations into modern situations, especially in film. As one scholar has noted, the Mahabharata has become, over the course of its long history, a vocabulary in which life can be discussed. This is all the more remarkable since the Mahabharata is not proper literature from the Sanskrit uh, as sorry, classification point of view, given that it is the genre of itihasa. It is Valmiki's poem, the Ramayana, that, it, from, that the aestheticians count as the first poem, as properly being poetry. The Mahabharata is usually talked about as a treatise on dharma, something rather different from poetry. Uh, a sort of Vedic text by marriage, a Veda in law, as it were, not a, not a poetic work. Yet this, despite this Shastric of official profile, Sanskrit aestheticians, Kuntika and Anand of Ardana, both of them influential intellectuals of the later first millennium, engaged with the Mahabharata as a work of proper art, one that can produce genuine aesthetic sentiment or rasa, or in one case, vakrokti. Thus it is fair to say that the Mahabharata has occasioned both artistic reaction and transcreation, as well as aesthetic reflection, and later, though I'm not going to go into this part of it, philosophical reflection in large amounts. And the whole of this reflection on the text itself and the material that surrounds the text itself all seems to belong together, or, or at least belongs together as part of one large conversation. <clears throat> modern scholarship, now I'm going to talk about modern scholars. Modern scholarship of the text from its beginnings in the 19th century, confronting this vast body of material in which the Mahabharata sits in its interwoven, intertextual totality, longed to put things into an order that would make it understandable, to them at least, by asking a certain sort of historical question. What is the actual text? When was it composed and by whom? How was it transmitted? Are there older and newer parts of it? Who added to it and why? <clears throat> Where does one draw the line between the text proper and the literature that supports it? As more and more manuscripts of the Mahabharata came to light over the course of the 19th century, it became clear that there was a lot of fluidity to the text of the epic itself in its 18 books. Indian publishers in Calcutta and Bombay had printed distinctly different versions of the epic. Studies of the work by scholars assumed these different versions and others based on manuscripts they had. Scholars were quite literally not on the same page. At a conference of Orientalists at the end of the 19th century, the German Sanskritist Morris Winternitz called for a proper historical edition of the text one that would attempt to reconstruct an early version, if possible the earliest version, and thus establish a text that everyone would agree on as a starting point for discussion. This widely shared ambition eventually took place as took shape as the critical edition of the Bandarkar Institute in Pune, which was published in many volumes over the decades of the middle of the 20th century. The intention of the project was historical and archaeological, to use a more organic metaphor, uh, that is archaeological in the sense of uncovering the strata, the different la historical layers of the text. To use a more organic metaphor, it was to disentangle the older tree, the Mahabharata in its early chapters describes itself as a tree, the older tree from the layers of vegetative overgrowth and undergrowth, as it were, that had surrounded the Mahabharata in the composted soil made fertile by its rich synthesis of narrative, myth, and history. I'll, I'll come back to this analogy a little bit later. <clears throat> On the 
Over the past century, therefore, scholars have usefully examined not just the 18 chapters of 18 books of the text, but also the surrounding material of commentary, compendium, retelling, synopsis, index, synthesis, quintessence, recitational manual, and so on, for what all of that material tells us about the history of the Mahabharata's text. Much of this material which surrounds the Mahabharata has therefore been noticed and taken account of by scholars and put to use in creating editions in order to get a sense of the history of the text itself. Commentaries, for example, frequently preserve alternative readings and deliberate them in a recognizably editorial sort of way. The Easterners read the text as this. If that's so, this is what it means. I prefer this reading to that reading for the following reason, sort of editorial activity. That's useful to a modern editor who's trying to decide what the readings actually were at particular moments in history. Compendia and synopses demonstrate what was part of the text at a particular historical moment and what appears not to have been, and so on. But the primary aim of all of this sort of activity was guided by the hope of finding the early text, even the original text, in order to determine what was original and what was later extraneous addition. It was a historicist project. This is a project that was worth carrying out, I think, and has, to some extent, achieved its goal. But it was perhaps hampered by assumptions, we realize now, that may not have been as well founded as had been thought. The tendency, for example, to think that the military parts of the epic were the heroic core was what guided many scholars. It may be that the comparison with the Greek epics and other old European heroic poetry misled early gener generation, earlier generations of scholars of Indic texts in deciding where to apply their pruning saws to the overgrowth. After all, the Mahabharata presents itself as a story of a war told by a Sutta, that is, a member of the squire or equerry class whose duty is to sing the glories of the battles of the knights and kings that they serve. And in the outer layers of the Mahabharata, the notion is expressed clearly that there is an 8,000 verse version of this text called the Jaya, the victory, which has then been surrounded by other lore to make a 24,000 verse Bharata, this then being vastly expanded to the Mahabharata of 100,000 verses. Nevertheless, it has turned out to be more difficult to treat the didactic components of the story as extraneous Brahminical editions. The earliest references to the contents of the Mahabharata that we have, for example, in a very early surviving manuscript called the Spitzer Manuscript, know of these didactic chapters already. The commentators certainly take these didactic passages very seriously. So in short, the project of attempting a stratigraphy of the epic, though difficult, and though perhaps in some ways eccentric, was a success up to a point. In practical terms, most scholars today refer to the critical edition as the text that they use, so that everyone knows what text they're talking about. That said, rather than strat stratigraphic archaeological terms, I think it might be more appropriate to think of the Mahabharata in more biocultural terms, as a sort of permaculture, a self-sustaining bioenvironment, as it were, in which many forms of life are co-located that mutually support and perpetuate the overall system. There are still distinct species of text within this culture which perform different tasks. But rather than an ecological monoculture, it is an ecological multiculture. The role of editors and scholars today is to aid this permaculture, if you like, in a sustainable and desirable way. So this may be a rather far-fetched analogy, but hear me out. I hope that as I come to some of the examples, what I'm gesturing toward might become more comprehensible. So here's one example. The Parva Sangraha. At some point in the history of the Mahabharata, those who were responsible for transmitting it, reciting it, and make, make, making use of it, created a versified index, 
or anukramani, a list of all the units of the text. We, we usually today think of the Mahabharata in consisting, as consisting of 18 parvans or chapters or books. The numerology of these 18 chapters matching the 18 days of the war, the 18 armies that were fighting, and so on. But in the transmission of the text in manuscripts and presumably in recitation, there is a division of the text into a hundred parvans, smaller bite-sized parvans. This is called the, the compilation of the sections, the parva sangraha, and it takes up one of the first, er, one of the earliest chapters of the Mahabharata as we have it today. This parva sangraha runs through the episodes, both central and digressive, and didactic, that make up the Mahabharata as we know it. Thus, the episode in which in which Ashwatthaman the elephant is killed is told in the Drona Vada Parva, the section, the chapter of the text about the killing of Drona. The story about the elephant Supratika and his brother the turtle Vibhavasu is told in the Astika Parvan, the story about the snakes. The story about the other, other elephant, Supratika, the one whom Bhima fights with, is found in the Bhishma Vada Parvan, the story of the slaying of Bhishma. So all these hundred mini Parvans, if you like, fit neatly within the big 18 Parvans. There are no overlaps there. But they have their own independent existence. It's quite clear by the way the manuscripts preserve them. So one of my points one of the points, aside from drawing attention to this as the kind of material I'm trying to talk about today, is that this list of parvans, this table of contents, or anukramani, is itself counted as one of the parvans of the Mahabharata. Thus, what probably began as a reader's aid developed by the custodians of the text became part of the text. Other lists of contents that run through the whole story in a concise way uh, are, uh, and, and in some cases more artfully done, are inserted to the text at its beginning. Even in the very first chapter of the epic, there is the famous Yadash Rausham passage. This is a series of verses that are put into the mouth of Dhritarashtra, the father of the Kauravas, the sort of the king on the throne, the blind king who doesn't see the wrong that's happening. Dhritarashtra basically, at the, at the very opening of the story, says, when, when I heard that such and such has happened, then I gave up all hope. And he runs through a whole, a, a whole series of things that gave, made him give up hope. When I, Yadashrausham Arjuna, Deva Devam, Kirata Rupam, Triambakam, Toshio Yudhe, and so on and so on, when I heard that Arjuna had pleased the three eyed Shiva in the form of a mountain man, in battle, and he had got, gained from that the Pashupata great weapon, Tada Nasham Sevijaya Sanjaya. Then I gave up all hope of victory, O Sanjaya. So there's, a se there's an artful series of these rhetorical, rhetorically repeated um, descriptions, which, by the way, give you all of the events of the Mahabharata in this very artistically, neatly constructed form. I suspect this is another versified summary of the text that might have in existed independently and was very usefully tucked into the text right at its beginning. Here's another example, uh, the Harivamsha. The Parva Sangraha, that list of parvans I just mentioned, counts as the Mahabharata's last three parvans, the three main sections of the Harivamsha. The Harivamsha is an early Vaishnava text that fills in the rest of Krishna's story. It is, as it were, the prequel uh, that expands to include Krishna's childhood and his early life in Braj, which the Mahabharata conspicuously does not relate. It adds other material connected with the practices of Vaishnavas, including forms of yogas, as well as other legends and myths. So this text, that seems to have been attracted to the Mahabharata by the prominence of Krishna in the Mahabharata, makes its way into a kind of provisional inclusion in the text. So we can watch in the Parva Sangraha and comparable indices the process by which the Harivamsha becomes reckoned as part of the Mahabharata, treated as integral, commented on by some of the later commentators, and so on. So it's not so much the Harivamsha itself, but the treatment of the Harivamsha by this supporting material that I'm describing. So from the point of view of the archaeologist of the text, these are later layers added onto the older core epic. 
But they are also evidence of the text's life, of how it outfitted itself with a self-understanding that made its boundaries porous so that it could become, to go back to my rather forced analogy, a home for other species that could thrive in its eco-environment. Krishna as a divine figure seems to have been central to the Mahabharata in its earliest versions from most of our evidence. So it is not unthinkable that the Harivamsha, a, a continuation of that story told in the same narrative voice, in the same metrical form, and filling out important information you need to know, uh, should be added into the text at its end. <clears throat> so now I want to uh, turn to another example. Uh, and for that, I would like to turn to the commentators. Now, about the commentators in the Mahabharata. Uh, Sheldon Pollock wrote an essay in his edited volume on world philology that charts the history of the phenomenon of commentary in Sanskrit. And one interesting finding of this article is how relatively late the phenomenon of commentary is for the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The earliest commentaries appear to date from only the 11th century, that is, long after the Mahabharata had been composed and had been reacted to and thought about and composed about by poets and philosophers. One of the two commentaries composed in that in the 11th century was by someone called Vimala Buddha. This commentary has never been published, but the editors of the critical edition uh, were aware of it, read through it, recorded in their notes many many things that Vimla Bodha had to say. A student of mine, Vishal Sharma, has collected copies of manuscripts of this commentary and is working on the history of the Mahabharata's reception as this can be tracked through the commentary. So I, I just have to flag here for the record that I am stealing him from him. Uh, <laughs> I, I bring up Vimla Bodha's commentary, commentary in order to make two points. One is about the whole phenomenon of commentary on the battle books of the Mahabharata, the four great chapters of the heart of the Mahabharata that describe the war itself. These four great chapters are named after the four generals on the Kaurava side, Bhishma, Drona, Karna, and Shalya. These four big books are followed by several shorter ones that tie up the end of the war. The first point is simply to note that the commentators have very little to say about these, uh, about these battles, about these battle books. Here is a point where the modern scholarly attitude toward the text might lead you to think that this would be where you would get the most commentary. Uh, <clears throat> if, uh, if military valor is really what heroic epics such as the Mahabharata is, is really about at its core, then the commentary should know that and talk about that. But there's a disconnect here. In fact, Vimala Bodha, from the entire vast Drona Parvan with its 200 or so adhyayas or chapters, picks out only three verses to discuss. And most of his discussion of the book in this epic is about another subject, which is calendrics, which I'll come back to and talk about later in the lecture if I haven't run out of time. Um, <clears throat> so in, this, uh, in the subsequent book, the Karnaparvan, Vimala Bodha again discusses only three verses as well as a fourth. And I want to talk about this fourth. This is my second point. This fourth, fourth verse is, is an ornate verse about an arrow that Karna draws to fire against Arjuna, which includes magically within it a snake. This snake is intent on vengeance because Arjuna had burned down the Khandava forest much long ago where that snake's mother lived and had perished. So I hope this is not too psychedelic a description of uh, <laughs> what's going on at this point. But the point of the verse is that the arrow that has been carefully designed includes this snake who's intent on you know, a, a, a living sentient entity intent on killing uh, Arjuna, doesn't kill Arjuna, but it does strike off this kirita, this crown that he uniquely has, which is in, inseparable from him. So the in, but the interest of the verse is how atypical it is. It seems not to be an epic verse at all. It is composed in the Shardula Vikridita meter. This is a meter reserved for ornate kavya. This is the sort of thing classical poets of the 9th and 10th century composed poetry in. It's not something Vyasa composed poetry in. And, it, and furthermore, it has this very clever shlesha that is um, sort of punning, playing on the word go, the Sanskrit word for cow which also can mean lots of other things as well. 
I'll just give you a line or two of it. Go karana sumuki kirtena ishuna, go putra sampreshita, go shabdatma jabhujshanam suvihitam suvyakta go suprabham. There's even goes where there actually aren't goes. Drishtva go gatakam jahara mukutam go shabda go puri vai, go karanasana mardanascha na yayava prapya mrityor, mrityor vasham. Sorry, that was the verse. Rather mangled. So it, to understand the verse requires knowing special lexicons that were created for poets of Shlesha Kavyas, poems that play on the multiple meanings of words, where go has something like 14 or more possible meanings that can be used. And so by using the word go in a number of different ways, the author is in one case referring to Arjuna, in another case referring to the snake, in another case referring to Karna, uh, and so on. So it's all very clever, basically. So. But what's remarkable to me about this verse is what Vimala Buddha has to say as he introduces it. Ayam chachaloka, this loka, kwachit karna parna, I'm uh, sorry, kwachit karna parvani nadrishyate. So you could understand that in two ways. One is, is never found in the karna parvan, and another is, is sometimes found in the karna parvan. Two possible understandings of that. Tatapi asyarto vyakriyate. But I'm going to explain it anyway. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so uh, all right, so I just explained it. So, talking about this verse becomes a habit for later commentators. Another commentator, Yagna Narayana, who was active two centuries later, his, his commentary also unpublished uh, so far, repeats Vimla Bodha's explanation and his introduction and comments on only the same few verses of the Karmat Parvan. Um, <coughs> la later commentators follow suit. It seems not to have been considered, at least in this genre of Sanskrit literature, uh, to be a fault to plagiarize, that is, to cut and paste the entire chunks of earlier commentaries uh, uh, into one's own commentary. So, but back to that verse with the word go in it, if one looks at the manuscripts that the Bandarkar Institute re editors used in making the edition of the Karna Parvan, this verse is found in most of the northern ones and many of the southern ones. That is to say, this is, an, this is a fairly clear example of a verse that must have been composed as an homage to the text by a clever poet of a later, of a later century and that found its way into the text because of the interest it produced in one of the commentators. And there are plenty of other verses that seem to have had a separate existence that but went on to become parts of the text for later readers. We can't always prove that this is what has happened. With this verse, verse because of Vimala Bodha's comment, we can either arguably or certainly, depending on how one reads that kwachit na or na kwachit. A recent article by Richard Solomon shows how the Buddha Charita underwent a similar process of amplification as poets attempted to imitate the style of the text and put their own verses into the margins of manuscripts of the Buddha Charita, these then creeping into later manuscripts of the body of the text. In the case of the Buddha Charita, it's very easy to prove this for various very contingent particular reasons to do with the Buddha Charita, which became a lost text. And uh, there are these extremely early fragments of it that are turning up in what used to be called Turkestan, up, in the, up on the Silk Road and places like that. So a similar thing must have been going on with the Mahabharata. The verse I've just mentioned with the word go in it might have belonged to a longer epitome of the Mahabharata that got folded into the text, at least until the critical edition took it back out again. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> and as has been pointed out, I'm sorry, as has been pointed out long ago, the irregular Trishtub verses in the Mahabharata, that is, the lo a longer, fancier verses that the Mahabharata breaks into from time to time. Some of these have an uh, irregular um, trishtu pattern. They're not the, the typical Upen, uh, Upajati style of these kinds of verses. They're in this older, more Vedic style of metrical form. If you look only at those, a scholar pointed out years ago, if you assemble those into a separate file, they more or less tell the entire story of the Mahabharata, including the main side stories of the Mahabharata, independent of the rest of the shloka meter. And when we encounter them in the body of the text, they seem to repeat things that come just before or just after them in the shloka form. So my point here is 
is not to insist on the, the late, laterness of these additions, and therefore their need to be excised uh, in attempting to reconstruct the earlier text. That's already been done. Um, that is a point I do accept the validity of, but I have a different one. These, ma these materials show the life of the Mahabharata for its readers. They show which parts later readers admired or were elevated by, or, by, uh, or that they responded to. So those are just, how am I doing on time? So oh, almost, I have a, am I, or is it all right? It's the Mahabharata, so you know. <laughs> There's a certain, it is possible to be concise. But. So those are just some of the examples that provide the notes toward an argument for the value of the material that lies outside the boundaries of the epic proper, not in writing the history of the text, but in writing the history of that text's meaning to its readers. So each compendium, table of contents, one verse synopsis of the entire of a text, two verse synopsis in, of the entire text, and so on. Manual for reading, manual for reciting, manual for worshiping, brings out certain features and highlights them as what the Mahabharata amounts to. I've got one more example I'll get to called the Bharata Savitri, which I think is a good example of this. An interest in the history of the reception of ancient canonical texts through their commentaries and related paratexts has gained prominence in the study of the literary traditions of other parts of the world because of its inherent interest and its utility for intellectual history. There are also projects on what are called satellite texts, of which the Go verse from the Karna Parvan is an example. This, a satellite text is a text produced in the margin to a text or, or in reactions or written at the, uh, on, the over, on the cover leaf of the text that travels with and eventually makes its way into or embeds the significance of the text it travels with. There is a current uh, European Research Council project headed up by Eva Wilden in Hamburg on satellite texts in Old Tamil, which is an excellent example of this. But there are comparable kinds of intellectual interest and many other sort of ancient literary traditions, uh, the Hebrew scholarship, Arabic scholarship, uh, Chinese scholarship, there are about comparable kinds of interest in the, not the, the, the canonical classic text, but the reception uh, history of the text through its uh, supporting literature. So I don't want to go into a whole rant about Indologists that was there in the abstract a little bit, I'm sorry about that, uh, being one myself. Uh, but I think it is safe to say that the Indological field has by and large remained hesitant about reception studies of the Mahabharata, in, in part because it is perceived to open the door to anachronistic reading, anachronistic readings, not historicist readings, thereby violating the governing disciplinary principle of historicism. We understand that we are aiming, what we are aiming at when we tr try to make a critical addition and try to summon up the spirit of the lost original text or whatever oldest descendant text is willing to attend our seance. But we are on shakier ground when we move into reception studies. We seem to be getting onto the turf of other kinds of experts and other kinds of general in, um, appreciators. We, we come up against filmmakers and modern authors and religious leaders and spokespeople for Indian culture when we walk through this door. Uh, so, so this is what I suspect the fear is. It's not entirely unfounded. But what I said in my abstract, and I have no way of knowing whether it isn't just a rant, is that built into this indological stance is a contradiction due to the huge extra academic importance in the present of Sanskrit texts like the Mahabharata. I began by talking about that. One is tempted to say that working on the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, which I should say, I should mention to you, is perhaps not the most prestigious subject within the Indology field itself. It's not hard enough. Uh, it's too easy, so it's sort of looked down on slightly by true endologists, though it is in fact the most interesting. Um, that in a way, the Mahabharata and Ramayana, our study of it supports our field more broadly. Uh, it, you could compare us to ballet companies who, who fund themselves for the year by putting on the nutcracker every Christmas. <laughs> uh, the, Mahabhar the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are worth discussing because of their own appeal. Uh, but also because of their great significance in the present. 
Now, in 1942, the founding, founding editor of the Bandarkar edition, the one that I've accepted and praised throughout, V. S. Suptankar, delivered a series of seminal lectures on the meaning of the Mahabharata. That was the title of the lectures uh, that were subsequently published. Uh, they're on archive.org if you're interested in looking at them. These lectures, in a way, for the Indologist, have not been superseded and are representative at the same time of our quandary. Suktankar proposed a meaning for the epic on three levels, mundane, ethical, metaphysical, trying to work entirely from within the text itself in its historical layers. He did not mention the commentators, the epitomizers, poets, literary theorists, yet he did rule out possible meanings of the text. Uh, and in doing so, he used as an argument simply the fact of how central the Mahabharata is to the Indian people. So the idea of the Mahabharata as India's national epic whispers through the 20th century scholarship, certainly present as at least a rationale, a, re a way to get funding, if nothing else. And yet the Mahabharata's popularity in the present is not just an accident of, ma of modernity. Um, I'm reading part of my abstract here. Um, the text was composed to create a mem remembered past. Over time, its transmitters adjusted that memory, and the text itself, as they performed it, codified it, and used it as a point of departure. Survivals of this process are abundant in the po Mahabharata's poetic and dramatic recreation, recreations and occasional pieces, but especially in its ancillary literature its commentaries, its satellite texts, its versified summaries, indices, marginal verses, and other material, some of which have crept into the body of the epic over time. So let me talk about one more example. How am I doing? One more example. I'm on the last page of my talk, I believe. Uh, yeah, just about. I'm on the last page of my talk. Let me go back to Vimala Bodha for a second. Vimala Bodha's commentary on the Drona Parvan Remember who Vimala Bodha is? He's that 11th century early commentator. Said, I'm going to comment on this even though it's not in the text, but to topi, just because. Uh, so he, um, as he gets into the Drona Parvan, instead, he enters into this long discussion. And it begins this way Kasmin ma se, Kasyam tito, Kasmin nakshatre, Mahabharata yudharambo ababat iti. So, on which, in which month, on which lunar day, Titi, and which nakshatra, that is, when the moon was in conjunction with which, which of the 27 uh, constellations did the Mahabharata war begin? And so that's what his discussion of the drone apartment is actually about. He then cites verses from various points in the epic that refer to the position of the moon in relation to the nakshatras, as well as the new lunar solar month and the stage in the fortnight. The problem is that these various verses that he's assembled present a sort of circle that can't be squared. And this is the ongoing problem for many people. Who, they, you know, this is sort of the endless puzzle, if you like, that people have talked about since Vimala Bodha's days and even into the present. For if the war lasts for 18 days, then there should basically be 18 conjunctions with nakshatras uh, that match that, more or less. There could be a missing nakshatra, there could be a, a, a lupta one, you know, that happens sometimes. There's various kinds of ingenious attempts to solve this problem, but there aren't. That is, there aren't, it's not easy. There, we don't start on one day and end on, we don't start with the right nakshatra and end with the right nakshatra over those 18 days. So that, that, that's one of the many problems. So in, in the lead up to the war, so here are the kinds of things that get cited. In the lead up to the war, Krishna mentions that the new moon will come seven days from the moment he's speaking. That's one bit of evidence. Then there's Krishna's brother Balarama who goes off on this long pilgrimage. We're told how many days it is. I think it's 40 or 42. Uh, he, la he arrives for the last terrible day of destruction. And he says that he set out on his pilgrimage when the, when the moon was with the constellation Pushya, and he returns on the constellation Shravana, uh, and we know the duration. And again, there is not a match in how many nakshatras there are between. So another sort of puzzle, if you like. Then, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, I once gave a lecture at the American Oriental Society that's title was, What is the Most Boring Topic in Mahabharata Studies? <laughs> and 
I have to, I have to retract that title. The, the answer to the question wasn't the point of the lecture, by the way. There was somebody who actually came to the, the conference just because they were worried that I was going to talk about them. You know. <laughs> so I, I learned inadvertently something about my colleagues. But I, uh, I, I did at that time contemplate the date of the, the, date of the war. Uh, as, as a boring question, just ex not because it's inherently uninteresting, but because it's un insoluble. Uh, it's sort of boring in that it can't be solved. But it is actually quite a rather an interesting problem. <coughs> so I won't get into all the details of this discussion, which is considerable, and which every commentator has an awful lot to say about. There's whole sections of the text that say nothing, and then they get to mention of nakshatras, and suddenly there's no, no shortage of ink, if you like. Uh, so <coughs> the point is, rather, that it is clear that this calendric question is deeply significant for the readers. I refer he briefly here to another text of reception, the Bharata Savitri. That is, this is a hundred verse recitation that is meant to be like the Gayatri Mantra. That is, the Bharata Savitri is meant to confer the spiritual effect of reading the entire Mahabharata. The same punya you get from reading the Mahabharata, you can get from reading reciting this 100 verse Bharata Savaritri. And by the way, this chit the Chitrashala edition of the Mahabharata and the Haribamsha, this is a 1930s era publication of the two, with a commentary, includes at the very end the Bharata Savaritri and lots of other manuals for how to recite and how to worship the Mahabharata. This Mah Bharata Savaritri starts out with a recap of events of the war, beginning from the failed peace talks and then moving on. And then it goes on to match up events in the war with calendric moments. So on the 13th lunar day, that is uh, Titi, at midday, Vrishasena was killed. On the morning of the 14th, Dushasana was killed, and so on. There's a whole section of this very brief uh, summary of the Mahabharata, which is just about the calendrics of it. So then it concludes, by the way, with five verses in which Vyasa cries out quite literally in the wilderness, will no one hear me? Follow the good, avoid the bad, and so on. But I will skip over that. It's hard not to get distracted. The, 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 the point here is uh, that, it, that, that you can't just say that the early readers of the Mahabharata we're not literal-minded about it. We're not fundamentalists about it. They understood it all was sort of allegorical or metaphorical or to be understood in a sort of loose way. Given the kind of close, precise attention they're making to moments, to astrological, if you like, moments. It's not an allegorical form of reading. It is an astrological reading that invests the epic with significance based on Jyotisha Shastra. Jyotisha, of course, is a science. It requires actual and exact dates and times. And there is a way in which this discussion depends on a literal understanding of events happening in time at some particular time. So the commentators often appear to uh, deal with events assuming both that they are fictive, uh, that they, are, they tell us something about our own souls uh, and um, our, our, state, our, our existence in this world, and also as things that actually happened and are, are, are continuing in a, in a sequence and that require practical understanding. How practically is it possible that this could have happened after that could have happened? So metaphysical interpretations may be possible, and there's no shortage of them, but they do not exhaust the meaning of the text for the readers um, that, as we understand them through the commentaries. So, OK, I, I think maybe I will just, uh, without any kind of a conclusion, I think I will just trail off at that point and, sim and simply say that the, uh, there is some, there's some value to going back and looking at this material, not giving up on our understanding of the historical layers of the text, but uh, welcoming back this material for what it tells us about what this, what this text means to us and to other readers. So thank you. So I suppose you want me, there's some time for questions, isn't there? I've lost track of it. Yes. Oh, sir. <coughs> Thank you, Chris, for a wonderful. Uh, so it gets recorded. <laughs> oh, how alarming. Uh, 
<laughs> well, boy, I, thank I'm you for you a there. wonderful <laughs> talk. Uh, ab about reception, uh, I, I, I note that your your whole argument is contained within the Sanskrit language. Yes. Commentaries, uh, uh, co uh, condensed versions, yes. uh, stotras, and so forth. Um, and within India, uh, National Epic of India. But of course, if we just went to, to Southeast Asia, we would find both epics uh, flourishing uh, much in much the way you say. Uh, people saying, uh, well, he's like Arjuna, he's like Bhima, using uh, epic figures as sort of psychological types for, to describe people, and so on and so forth. <coughs> I, I don't know much about this, but I have a lot of friends in Southeast Asia, and when I read, wrote the Elephant Book, I read a lot of stuff. Uh, one little bit that was very interesting to me was, uh, at Angkor Wat, there is a depiction of the Ramayana. I'm not remember, remembering the details, but you know, the arrival of Indian culture, the epics, the Brahmi script, the creation of a script for the Khmer language results in epics written in Khmer, uh, which then an archaeologist may compare to the depiction of this Ramayana scene at Angkor Wat and saying, is it closer to the Khmer version or the you know, the Sanskrit mm. version, this kind of thing. Mm. So here's an example of the kind of phenomenon you're talking about. What would happen to your talk if you <laughs> if you exploded it to <laughs> such things yeah. as versions in other languages, yeah. right. uh, sculptural representations, uh, Wayan uh, 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 you know, puppetry, mm. Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, would it become just unmanageable? I'm thinking that perhaps what doesn't happen is this kind of feedback mechanism where outer satellite bits get incorporated in the original Sanskrit, or the, that might be a yeah, limit. Original, you have to be but careful with the yeah, original, yeah. When it <laughs> comes to the Ramayana, you know, there are, I, it's quite, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I'm just throwing out this uh, question to, to see how you would react to a possible expansion of this interesting <laughs> idea to all other kinds of arts and so forth. Yes, I, I would welcome it. I would uh, welcome, somebody, uh, welcome someone with the, uh, the skills to do it, uh, to do it. You know, it's, it's, it's quite true. Uh, my talk was quite an inside baseball sort of a talk in the end. It's really about what's going on in, in my own field. Uh, and the way that that field interacts with a much larger uh, interest in both the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, and in which the Sanskrit versions occupy a certain kind of distinguished position, but may not be the versions that everybody you know, loves and knows the best, uh, especially, especially for the Ramayana. Uh, so yes, I'm perfectly willing to concede that point, that there's, that there's a great deal more there. And from time to time, there are these big uh, sort of global or international cross-cultural studies of Mahabharata, V. Raghavan, mm. you know, uh, was the head of a, s a couple of these projects. There was a big collection of essays that he was the editor of called the Greater Ramayana. I think he, he was particularly more, more interested in the Ramayana. The same sort of thing could be done for the Mahabharata as well, however, as you say. Mm. Um, it has, it's part of a, a much larger cultural package, which, I which is, uh, you know, a large cosmopolitanism that is spreading all over, sort of inner Asia and down into Southeast Asia. Uh, so thank you for your talk. Uh, my question is, uh, is about uh, the difference between the Mahabharata, as you have studied it in, manus in its manuscript form, and also in print, in early printed editions. So you mentioned that there are hundred parvans in some of the uh, in some of the manuscripts. And I'm interested in um, learning about how the hundred becomes eight, or do, they, do, the, do the manuscripts have the eight parvans as well as the hundred kind of mini 
parvans and what happens to that uh, because in in the printed editions sorry i i've been saying eight i've been meaning to say 18, 18 uh, yeah. yeah so what happens uh, and i mean so in the printed editions we usually see only 18 books yeah. so how does that uh, happen yeah if you look if you look into some of the um, publications produced uh, by indian publishers in the, in the 19th century the um, the steam press in bombay and the the publishers in calcutta you find some versions that are, that just tell you which of these of the mini parvans it is, and there are there are certainly manuscripts of like Bhishma Vada Parvan. That's what the manuscript is a manuscript of, rather than the whole text, or it may run from the beginning of this parvan to that mini parvan and not be the entire big parvan that that sits in. If you see what I mean, um, yeah. Usually the colophons, this where the scribe signs off and tells you what you know, what the title of the text was and so on. It will, if it's an ornate one, it will give you both in the, you know, whatever, in the Bhishma Parvan, in the Bhishma Vada Parvan, this sort of, uh, you find that sort of colophon. Sometimes you find just the big Parvans mentioned, sometimes you find just the mini Parvans mentioned. So they do seem to have some kind of textual reality in the, at least in the copying tradition. And I suspect this has, their size is more may be achievable for rec reciters within a particular sort of unit of time, rather than these you know, parvans that, uh, that have 15 to 20,000 verses in them. It'd be hard to do that in a single sitting, if you see what I mean. Whereas one that's a couple hundred, or maybe seven, eight hundred is sort of imaginable to do in a day. I suspect it has something to do with it. I mean, I, I should say that a, a lot of this, a lot of this uh, supporting material that I'm talking about here is actually following a pattern that's much more strongly repre represented for the Vedas. So, the, of course, the Vedas have this huge uh, cultural significance within Brahminical culture, and they're preserved, you know, this is, the, this is the main job of Brahmins in this very early period, is to remember their Veda and transmit it. And they evolve a set of, uh, without writing it down, for the most part, or if they write it down, uh, memory tradition always trumps the written version because the, the, there's always mistakes in copied things and printed things. S so they evolve a series of techniques to ensure that the memory tradition is complete and verifiable, if you like. Uh, and so some of these are very specific to um, the, ex the verbatim recitation of the Veda. There are these things called the Padapata and the Kramapata and the Jathapata, where they res basically recite the words of verses of the Veda forwards and backwards, if you like. Um, um, and there's no nothing comparable to that for the Mahabharata, but the other parts of it, these Anukramanis, these indices, who are all the rishis in the Rig Veda of all of the different hymns? There's a list of those that was compiled very early. Who are all the de devatas of each verse of the Rig Veda? Who are all, um, what are the, what are the um, verses, what are the verse forms of all of the, so a, a sort of, it's all bookkeeping. Um, some of it is versified, some, uh, clearly it's all designed to be easily remembered. Then there are uh, systems within the Veda for, um, for example, um, you'll find a published text like the Mysore edition of the Taitriya Sanghita, if you should ever look at that. Uh, Includes some of these recitational material, like that every fiftieth word in a text would be s picked out and memorized as a sequence itself. So, uh, and I uh, actually once studied with a with a pundit who was a Taittiriyaka, and we were reading a text that had some Vedic words in it, and it had been edited by one of his great rivals. Uh, we, we, yeah, we did that. So, <laughs> and uh, and that. That text, um, the editor had not noted where in the Taittiriya uh, literature this word appears. So he was you know, quite contemptuous of this. And said, Aham vachmi, so I will tell you. And then he sort of spaced out for a minute. Uh, and then he said, this word occurs three times in the Taittiriya Sangita, and these are the places where it occurs, and then two times in the Brahma, and so on. So I wrote it all down, I went and checked, and he, yeah, he was right. He missed one, but you know, <laughs> it was okay. And it, <clears throat> everything that he got, he got. And it was because you can then, f uh, I'm sorry, I'm digressing here, but you can, 
you can pick up the word and keep going till you get to one of these marker words. And then you know where, where in the text you are if you memorize the sequence of those marker words within a big unit that, you, that has a number on it, if you see what I mean. So there's a, there's a lot of this material that grew up around uh, to preserve the Veda in a particular kind of you know, or, oral traditional way that is making its way into the Mahabharata where they don't really have the hope that are, people are going to remember the entire Mahabharata by heart verbatim. I sup I'm sure there have been people who have done it, but it's not a, it's not a cultivated practice. So instead, they have more like uh, summaries of contents, um, uh, readings or interpretations of the significance of portions. Just, I mean, because the text is so vast, just, just to give people a kind of you know, way through it, an orientation toward the text. So, that, so I'm not sure if that's answering your question or not, but a lot of these sort of dividing the text, creating a, you know, useful units of the text, is following a model that they've already perfected for another somewhat rather different literature. Thank you, Christopher. That was just an extraordinarily interesting talk. It, that was an extraordinarily interesting talk. Oh, and thank you. to do it on a jet lagged, uh, anxiety <laughs> frazzled <laughs> mind is really <laughs> impressive. Um, I wonder if you would, maybe you were getting to the answer that I am seeking here just at the end of your um, response a moment ago. I wonder if you would reflect on um, the relationship between the Mahabharata and the Ramayana a little bit. We're used to thinking of the Ramayana as having many, many versions. Um, we're, used to, um, we're used to seeing that as a malleable text, one that's very difficult to locate. Historically even, you know, an Ur text is not something we go looking for very often. It sounds like you're talking about something slightly different with the Mahabharata uh, in relation to the supporting texts that it's you know, framed within that also alter it over time and make different versions, I suppose. Um, uh, why are they, wh is this the same process, but one text is just much more massive? Or are they different processes? And why does there seem to be less concern about historicized readings of the Ramayana than there has been, at least historically, with mm. the Mahabharata. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, a lot of things are paradoxical. but um, So the Ramayana is, of course, shorter. Uh, the tradition thinks that it's, pre it's more beautiful uh, than the Mahabharata. It's, um, even modern scholarship has the feeling just looking at the manuscript situation of the two texts, that the, the Ramayana does really seem to be sort of possibly really the work of one person that then, that then grew a bit here and there. And maybe, okay, maybe the Uttarakhanda, you know, depending how you feel about what Rama does to Sita and the Uttarakhanda, you, you might want to excise that chapter in any case, or you abandoning her in the forest after all. Um, so, um, it's, it's sort of, it, you know, paradoxically, it actually seems to be more uh, you know, possible that it's the work of a unique author, where, whereas um, uh, Valmiki, why not? So the, whereas the Mahabharata, uh, you know, the current theory is that there's, there's a kind of compilation, right, that there might be a team. You know, the most radical version, this is Alf Hiltabaitl's version, is that there's a committee, you know, that sits down and there's a couple of decades where they, they take all the stories and they put them together into a kind of unit which is quite recognizably the Mahabharata we have today, and that's sometime first century AD or more likely first century BC. That's, that's the Alf Hiltabaitl argument. There's a, there's a whole, there's a, if you come to the American Oriental Society, the, the epics panels these days are just filled with all of this tension over, the, over these issues. Um, but um, the, the, the uh, the thing is that uh, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana uh, know, in a way, they know of each other. He, the Mahabharata tells the story of the Ramayana at a certain point. The Ramayana and the Mahabharata seem to be patterned on each other in terms of, you know, there's sort of the childhood section, then there's the political tension chapter, which is resolved in two very different ways, but both end up with an exile, one voluntary, one grudging, if you like. Uh, and then there's a war. So they, they seem to be aware of each other, but um, it seems as though <clears throat> the Ramayana 
is somehow more wholesome. Uh, there are, um, because of the sort of moral character of the, of the primary figure, uh, the Ramayana is more exemplary. It come, it's, a, it's thought to, perhaps for this reason, it's thought co to come from a more uh, ideal past age than the Mahabharata. I mean, the Mahabharata is real human conflict. It's cousins killing each other. It's, it's all much sort of harder to take. Uh, and in fact, there are story. You hear stories of people saying that the Mahabharata is bad luck. It's a little bit the way that um, you know actors won't refer to Shakespeare's play except as the Scottish play because it's supposed to be you know, bad. And who knows? Maybe the reason I had such trouble getting here. <laughs> uh, so they are aware of each other, and in a sense, they're patterned on each other. In fact. Um, the scholar Yugal Bronner, who wrote a book about Shlesha Kavya, I don't know if you know this book, it's called Extreme Poetry. It's about poetry that simultaneously on, this, on a, using the same words, or at least the same sounding words, tells the story, t t says two things at the same time. And it's not that it says one thing and implies another, it's actually saying both of them. And there are uh, somebody, by the 12th century or so, there are poets who are starting to try to tell the whole story of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana simultaneously using the same world. In fact, this becomes the main project of Dvisandana Kavya. And Brahner suggests that perhaps the reason for that is that in a way the Ramayana can heal the Mahabharata of this sort of deep wound that's present, you know, the sort of the terrible events of that story which are so you know, painful. And so it might, it might have something to do with that part of it. It's definitely the case that the Ramayana is subject to a, to a lot more reto uh, retellings, poetic creations. Some of that may have to do with the simplicity of the story, um, the um, uh, sort of the less problematic uh, nature of the story, if, aside, of course, from some episodes that we could get into. And, um, <coughs> Uh, and so, and so for, the, for those reasons, it's attracted more interest. But part of this also has to do, I think, simply with the attention of scholars today. So the Ramayana, everybody knows that a lot of people wrote commentaries on the Ramayana from fairly early on. And this, uh, this is my, st my student, Vishal Sharma, has, um, has, this is one of his discoveries. What is known is that as these big Vaishnava movements really come into a kind of prominence in South Indian culture in the second millennium AD. Uh, the Sri Vaishnavas and the Madhvas and you know, these various other um, Bhakti Bhagavatas and so on in South India with uh, temple cults and connections to royal pat patronage and so on. You start to get a lot of interest, particularly in the Mahabharata, because I think of its, um, sort of, of its, sort of its good presentation of a, sort of the ideal king, you know, the ideal ruler, again, with you know, consequences and implications of, you know, Ram Raj and so on. And I'm sure this, this group knows m more about than I do. But the, the, uh, that seems to be a moment when suddenly a lot of these commentators either tell very polemically composed versions of the Ramayana or actually write commentaries, very detailed commentaries on, e on every bit of it. Whereas the Mahabharata, as you see, I mean, it's just the exhaustion of it. You, you know, the, the 30th time there's showers of thousands of arrows going back and forth between the earth. You know, as a commentator, you, you, there is an out. You can just say, okay, I've explained this already. I, I, I've explained what all these arrows are. There's no deep significance here aside from he's shooting him and he's shooting back. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move ahead to actually to the Raja Dharma. I'm going to skip the rest of the war. This is what happens. There's chapters and chapters of the, of the war where no commentator says anything until much later. Whereas the, um, the, uh, the Ramayana, there's a lot of attention uh, because of the figure of Rama and where he fits in the theology of some of these movements, especially um, Ramanuja's movement. Uh, there's a lot of interest in him. And so the, the commentaries sort of freeze the text, if you like. You get a very secure text because the commentaries have to have a text that, that they agree on to talk about. Um, but what um, Vishal has found is actually those same authors that are doing that to the Ramayana are doing it to the Mahabharata as well. But this has just generally been less, people have been less interested in that. So there are Vaishnava authors in the South in this period. They're all some kind of a Vedanti. Um, and they're drawing theological significance out of the epic as a whole. Or they're getting into certain kinds of polemical 
and theological disputes with the other movements and the Shaivas also. So the Shaivas are think the Mahabharata is really their text. And there's this brilliant um, Shaiva intellectual called Appayadikshita. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's, this, he's a, from the Tamil lands. He's this sort of super meta polymath. He's sort of, he's sort of uh, all of the disciplines are just child's play to him. And so he writes commentaries on texts from 16 points of view. And he's sort of, he's sort of terrifying, uh, terrifying how. Okay. So he, he, writes it, he writes a comment, he writes a polemical work that proves that the Ramayana is really a Shaiva text. Now it's quite ingenious, and it uses the arguments about rasa theory, and he draws in every possible Shastra, and it's all quite ingenious, but it seems a little, a little improbable on the face of it. But there are Madhvas in particular, and then also uh, Sri Vaishnavas who go crazy, and they sort of write these rejoinders for generations afterwards in response to that. So that, the, what's going on, especially in South India among these different sampradayas who have all become sort of high-end high Brahminical intellect, Sanskrit intellectuals who are using Vedanta, Nimamsa, and Nyaya to carry out their arguments. Um, they suddenly see these important you know, epics as a field that they haven't fought over before. And so they, it seems as though they charge into it. And so you start getting commentary in the spirit. I didn't really get into this because I was trying to talk about earlier period things where Tom, like the Arthashastra Shastra and so on, which I didn't even get to. But I'm not sure if that's answering your question. But, but they, the, the two texts have sort of a different um, aesthetic uh, impact and aesthetic feel. And um, that may explain some of the reasons for the difference in treatment. But some of the reason, I think, simply has to do with um, it's happened, but we don't, they're more similar than we thought, but we, we don't know about it. Um, very much enjoyed the talk. It's fascinating. Uh, I had a, a comment, and well, a question, and then just a thought. So you mentioned the sort of progression of the growth of the Mahabharata, from the Jaya to the Bharata to the Mahabharata. Uh, do we know what sort of led people or the kings or whoever to actually engage in those accretions? Uh, were those things that were existing works that they added on? Were they potentially commentaries that became stories and then sort of got added on? Or do we know much about that process? What led to that? Well, and then know, it's, the this very, it's this very tempting you know, reference that there is, that's there in the Mahabharata and that seems as though it's telling you the history of the text. I mean, if you're a text historian right. who's trying to find layers to the text, here's the smoking gun. It's telling you first it had 8,000, then 24, then 100. But, and there were even some scholars who attempted to, I am now going to tell you, you know, which were the 8,000. You know, these sorts of projects went on in the 19th century. But the problem was, you know, they didn't work out. Or it, somebody might have made a convincing argument to themselves, but not to everyone else, if you see what I mean. So the, the answer is, it's been difficult to match that, that material up with um, the text as we have it. It seems, I mean, you could take it sort of metaphorically to mean the tradition knows that this text grew over time and rather massively. Um, but uh, practically, how does that actually play out? I, I don't think we, we, the thing you have to remember is that in the text is, is got, there's got to be a big version of the Mahabharata by the time of Ashwagosha, so that's first, second century AD. Uh, and our oldest man, most of our manuscripts come from, you know, the Mughal period or slightly earlier. So there's a long period where there just there aren't a lot of manuscripts. There's bits and pieces, and that's why um, scholars have resorted to all of this other material to try to you know, figure out what they can. I mean, there are there are ways to do it. There's been this very in interesting project Patrick Oliveville carried out on the um, Manusmriti, where he tried to sort of work from within the text itself uh, to sort of uncover earlier versions of the text in a very interesting book that will come out, I think, maybe this year, I don't, uh, by Mark McClish on the <coughs> Atashastra, does a similar thing. Is it out? Oh, good. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.